So, this morning, um, I'll have the verses up on screen as I usually do. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll be looking at uh, a passage uh, primarily in Matthew. Um, but there are parallel passages actually in the Gospel of Mark and also the Gospel of Luke. But we'll spend most of our time in, in uh, Mark. So, And if you want to follow along, those are the verses there. Um, so just a, a little bit of context and give you an idea of where we are. We're in the town of Capernaum, which is on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. It, it was primar its primary industry was fishing, and Jerusalem is actually off the map down below. Um, it's not actually pictured on the map. So what happened before our study passages today? So a little over a month ago, Michael was here, and he presented a lesson on the temple tax. And the events from that lesson take place directly before our study verses today. And you recall that um, in Michael's lesson, Jesus told Peter to go to the Sea of Galilee, and he told us to hook into the sea and take the fi first fish that came up. And then when Peter opened the fish's mouth, there would be a, a shekel there that would be enough for both Jesus and Peter's uh, temple tax. But even prior to the events that Michael taught on, uh, in the preceding chapters and verses, the Lord Jesus Christ actually foretells his death and resurrection twice. There's also a passage where he tells his disciples words that we're all familiar with, that they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. And there's also an account um, where Peter, James, and John witness the transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's one more account of Jesus healing a boy with a demon, which the disciples were unable to cast out because Jesus said they had little faith. And uh, it's also tied to that passage where Jesus talks of faith as the size of a mustard seed. So that's where we are in the context of Mark's, uh, Matthew's chronology. And it's roughly the same chronology in Mark's account and Luke's account of this event. Um, and as we study these verses, as I mentioned, that uh, we'll spend most of our time in Matthew's account. Uh, but we'll start with Mark. Oh, sorry, we'll go ahead here. Uh, actually, we'll roll back, sorry. <laughs> I'll just read these out for you. Um, so in Matthew's account, um, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And I'll just skip ahead here. Um, so, in Mark's account, it says that they arrived in Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing and arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the road, they discussed and debated uh, with one another which one of them was the greatest. And then in Matthew's account, um, it's written, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So why were the disciples talking like this? at this time. And, and thinking back to just what happened, Peter had just gone off to catch a fish. He presumably was not at the house where Jesus was. And this, this could potentially have been Peter's home. We know that Peter was married um, because there's an account of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. So perhaps this was Peter's home that they were at. And now Peter has gone away. He's, temp he's left temporarily and the other disciples um, have returned and are talking and arguing about something. And Jesus, as God already knows what they've been talking about, and perhaps this argument was spawned by the fact that, well, one, they were jealous because P Peter wasn't around and um, Jesus um, had, had chosen Peter to be the leader of their group. He, in fact, he told them a few verses, uh, chapters earlier that um, upon this rock I will build my church. And that's got to be enough um, to, to get the disciples slightly jealous. And then, of course, um, it was Peter, James, and John who the Lord Jesus Christ chose to go with him um, up to the mountain to witness the transfiguration. Mark tells us uh, when Jesus asked them what they were talking about uh, on the way, probably on the way to Peter's house, that they actually they don't answer him. And knowing what we know about what preceded this event, we can probably imagine the look on the Lord Jesus Christ's face at that time when he asked him this question. Because earlier he was speaking of his death, and after his death and resurrection and ascension to heaven, 
the men that he's entrusting with the care and feeding and sending of the church body are arguing about which one of them is the greatest. And Matthew gets more specific that they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So after spending all of this time with Jesus, learning from him, they still ended up asking the wrong question. They ended up arguing with each other as to who was the greatest. Because uh, for as long as we've had recorded history, human beings have always been preoccupied with being great, with gaining position and power. We want attention, we want acclaim, we want people to acknowledge our awesomeness, whether we have that awesomeness or not. Um, because to us on earth and to the world we're living in, that's, that's a high priority. And it was no different for the disciples back then. They were thinking about power, they were thinking about fame, they were thinking about prestige, they were thinking about wealth. They wanted everyone to know They wanted everyone to know who they were. And they wanted all that they could get from an earthly kingdom because they had only an earthly perspective. Instead, the question they should have been asking themselves is, how does one become great in God's kingdom? Not our kingdom, the one that we built for ourselves, which is really about as far as your arms can reach without moving your feet. So this, this actually begs a question. What is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? The disciples clearly didn't have an understanding of the kingdom of heaven and what it was. And the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, it it's, can be used interchangeably in the Gospels. And I'm going to paraphrase the late Pastor R.C. Sproul's description of it, is wherever God reigns supreme. We know that God is timeless. We know that God transcends time and space, so God is everywhere. And so therefore, the kingdom of heaven is everywhere. That's the simple answer. Um, because John the Baptist is, is preaching in Matthew chapter 3, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So how can John the Baptist say it's at hand when the understanding is that God is everywhere? Well, the, the kingdom of heaven is everywhere, except in a heart that's closed to him. Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of a Messiah who would save his people. He would save them from sin and from death. But the disciples had fallen back on the thinking, save us from Rome, save us from our oppressors, redeem and restore the land of Israel and, and her people. But the kingdom of heaven isn't a physical place like a city or a country or a church building, a church building. The kingdom of heaven is a presence of God come to us wishing to be with us through the saving power of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. The kingdom of heaven, it was not deliverance from Roman oppression, but deliverance from the penalty of sin. The kingdom of heaven is not doing your own thing and living within a set of man-made rules that determine salvation. It's living in mind, it's living in body, it's living in heart under the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The kingdom is the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning in our hearts and minds. So with that background of what the kingdom of heaven is and what Matthew is referring to, let's continue to the next set of verses. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. So since Jesus called the twelve, um, the assumption is that Peter has returned from catching that fish and paying the taxes. So this is for everyone to hear. And usually when a writer of one of the books in the Bible says that someone with teaching authority like a rabbi has sat down, that means that they're about to teach a lesson. Because, uh, so that's, that's when, a, when a rabbi sits down in ancient Israel, that, that's the equivalent of a preacher taking the pulpit. In ancient Israel's rabbis always taught from a seated position. So whenever you read in the Bible that Jesus sits down and people start to gather towards him and gather around him, it means that he's going to teach a lesson. So the Lord Jesus Christ says to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And so scholars have referred to sayings like this as one of the many spiritual paradoxes of the Christian life. Basically, the way up is down. The disciples were arguing who amongst them was the greatest, and maybe if you're Peter, who just pulled the tax money out of the mouth of a fish, you might even be smug and say, hey guys, that's me, I'm, I'm the greatest among us. But 
with Jesus' first words after sitting down in a teaching position, he tells them that they've got it all wrong. And this isn't even his harshest statement, but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Now, there, there's this tendency among all of us who want to be first or the one that wants to be the boss of all or pop, the popular one out there. We, we all have that innate desire. We want to be the guy who runs around bragging that he's got wife or the woman who can't stop showing off her $100,000 engagement ring. And it, we're, we're trying to tell people I'm relevant because of what I own or what I do for a living or who I'm married to or whatever. Pay, pay attention to me because I'm awesome because I have all these things. And Jesus is saying that's not what's important. Instead, he's saying if you really want to be first, if you really want to be the greatest, must be last and you must be a servant. Because there's, there, and there's two additional words here that, that we need to pay attention to. They're very important. The Lord Jesus Christ says you must be last of all and servant of all. So th there's a tendency when, when we read these verses to, to overlook the of all part. And all means all. Well, and some, some people may say themselves, can I just be kind to my family? No. Can I just be kind to the people in my community, the people outside my community, they're, they're, they're not like me? No. All means all. Years ago when, when Nathaniel and Crystal were volunteering at City Impact, they, they couldn't choose who they wanted to serve there. It's like when a homeless person came up to them, when a low-income person came up to them, they, they served all of them. Or when John, um, in his day job as a teacher, he can't just serve some of the students, he has to serve all the students. All, all means all. And when the Lord Jesus Christ says all in these verses, he really means all people. And realistically, all, all is a choice, and it means cutting off that one part of you that just wants to be first in line, that wants to be the head of the class, wants to be seen by everybody. I mean, we know that as pride. Um, you've probably heard the saying that pride is a five-letter word. Um, with a capital letter I in the middle because I is the central letter in the word pride. Um, I represents the disciples who were thinking about being great and it represents us when we turn our attention to ourselves. Our, our prideful selves don't want to go low. But Jesus says that if you want to be great in the kingdom of heaven, that's the only way. And this goes back to what the Lord Jesus Christ was telling his disciples just a few chapters earlier that they need to deny themselves and follow him. So what comes next is uh, Jesus' harshest statement because they, they weren't denying themselves uh, and instead uh, they, the apostles, the disciples, the 12 disciples were puffing themselves up. So he decides to teach them a lesson. So back to Matthew and uh, it, it's written, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So we're, we're not sure where the child came from. We don't know if Peter and his wife had children, but Jesus calls to him a child. And Mark says in verse 36 of his account that Jesus took the child, set him before them, and took the child in his arms. But notice what the Lord Jesus Christ says here. He says, unless you turn. So in the Amplified Version, uh, or translation, it's rendered as this. He called the little child and set him before them and said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, unless you repent, that is, change your inner self, your old way of thinking, change lives, and become like children, trusting, humble, and forgiving, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Um, but the New Living Translation has an even, has um, a much more clear um, translation of this verse, where it's written, then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And usually when, when we take all these verses, when, when we read over these verses initially, um, we're automatically drawn to the part of Jesus holding a child. And it, and it triggers a pleasant image of Savior being like a proud father holding a newborn in his arms in the maternity ward and our, our minds like that image. That's the Jesus that we're used to and that's the Jesus that we want. We want that kind shepherd who takes us in his arms when we're lost uh, or, or when we're hurting or when the ground seems to have fallen out beneath us. 
But the focus here isn't about the innocence of a child, per se. It's about the ego of the disciples. So the Greek word for turn is strafo, and it does mean to turn around from your current course of action, or to convert. Turn from your sins is something the disciples weren't expecting to hear at all. And the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking directly to them when he says, unless you change your current course, unless you change your course of action, unless you change the direction that you're headed in, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And we, part of us may be questioning the word never, and that's the Greek word ma, and it really tr literally translates into the word never. There's no doubt as to what the meaning is. It means never. And you can probably imagine the look on the disciples' faces, and they're probably staring at him in shock, because eight chapters earlier in the book of Matthew, Jesus sent out these same 12 disciples two by two to drive out demons and to heal the sick. And after all that, after spending all that time with Jesus, he's telling them that they still need to change their lives or they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. After all that they did previously, they still wouldn't enter because of the attitude that they had at their, that very moment. Very harsh words, especially when you use those words today. Um, because the, the current mentality going through some churches uh, is that, hey, pray a prayer, pray a prayer, ask Jesus into your heart, you're saved forever, no matter what you do. Follow these rules, stay within those, these guidelines, you'll be saved, no matter what you do. And the Lord Jesus Christ is contradicting all of that. The, the problem with that way of thinking is that it's an incomplete understanding because we often forget that when we sin against God and when we sin against our fellow human beings, we have to repent. And then we, we have to turn from that sin. That, that's, an, that's an irrevocable fact of, of our lives right now. We, we will sin. And we will keep on sinning because we're, we have that fallen nature that was passed on to us by Adam and Eve. When it comes to our relationship with God, you have to repent. That's the part that's missing. You can't just say, oh well, God, God will forgive me anyway for, for what I did. You, you, you can't wholeheartedly turn from a sin that you haven't repented of. But again, that, that's how some of the adults in the modern church are starting to behave. There's no accountability because they think or they've been told that they're the greatest and above everyone else. That the consequences of sin are for other people and not them. They think that because they've said a prayer, gotten baptized, and can call themselves Christian, they're awesome and impeachable. They can do anything and say anything they like. John had mentioned in his lesson about last week about how new Christians tend to act holier than thou. And he also said that the biggest problem of deeply religious people, people who've been in the church for a while, is pride. Um, some think that because their church has a thousand people in attendance that they've got a band that rocks, that they've got an, an awesome preacher who, who teaches great life lessons, that, that that's an awesome church and they're proud to be a part of it. And they think that because they've got that church, they've got that job that they've been after, that they've, that they've, they've got something that, something that other people envy, that, they can, that they're awesome, that they can go out of their way and let people know that they're awesome. And they think that now, because of Jesus, that they're on top of the world, looking down on everyone else. That's, that's the wrong way of thinking, similar to the 12 disciples and their thinking at this moment in time. That's like thinking that gravity doesn't exist. That if, guaranteed, if you decided to stand on, on top of, the, of, this, uh, of this building right now, you will find out that gravity is real, because uh, the last time I checked, none of us can actually fly. Um, so if you're up there, if a person is up there flying high right now, you're going to come back down to earth whether you like it or not. And so the Lord Jesus Christ calls a child to himself to teach the twelve a lesson. And we know from, from the description that Jesus didn't bring an infant to him, but a child who could walk on their own and uh, who, could, who could obviously see him and walk towards him. So what did the Lord Jesus Christ want them to learn from this child? So it's written, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He most certainly didn't want them to be childish, 
which is how they were acting when they were arguing as to who was the greatest. And yet the answer to who was the greatest was exemplified best by a child, a child who came to him willingly. So first, what does this say about the character of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it, it, that he had a, a peaceful, non-threatening spirit. He had a welcoming and warm feeling about him, such that a child would just come to him without reservation. And we prob when we've all met people who are the opposite of this, who are, who are acting like the disciples, probably so arrogant and so proud and so boastful and so full of self-conceit that it just comes out of their pores. And, and you just want to keep your distance from someone like that. And more often than not, they make you feel like you're orbiting around them. And they may be able to hide uh, all of that behind a mask when they're around adults, but you can't really fool a small child. They can sense when someone's safe to go near. And Jesus' character was an approachable one. And in just that one moment, the child demonstrated what his disciples needed to turn from. A person who's selfish, self-absorbed, and entitled, who says mine more times than they say mom, would never approach Jesus the way this one child did. And Jesus was telling his disciples, you are all not like this child. You need to turn from your ways and be like this child. So what do they have to turn from? Uh, we've already mentioned some of the characteristics they had. They were proud, they were envious, they were jealous, they were covetous, they were worldly, and they were divisive. Instead, what the child showed them, just by the action of Jesus calling the child and the child obeying, is that instead of being proud, they needed to be humble. Instead of being envious, they needed to be content. Instead of being jealous, they needed to be satisfied. Instead of coveting, they needed to let go and deny some of their desires. Instead of being worldly, they needed to be godly. And instead of being divisive, they needed to be united as a body of believers. So what exactly did the child demonstrate by coming to Jesus? So first, the child demonstrated an unrestrained trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's hard to trust people. We've all been burned way too many times by people, but Jesus isn't other people. When other people hurt us and wound us, we don't trust them again. We may forgive even if the other person can't admit fault or reconcile with us, but we, we set up these boundaries to keep them at, at a distance so that they don't hurt us again. The child trusted because Jesus' character was unlike those of his disciples. The disciples were trying to one-up each other, and Jesus demonstrated uh, a peacefulness, a warmth, a welcoming um, demeanor. And that's a, that's a trusting person and one who draws trusting people towards them. So another, another trait that the child demonstrated was obedience. Whatever the child might have been doing at that time, uh, he just dropped what he was doing. Jesus called. He could have been playing at something, something that took his full attention, and yet Jesus called the child. The child stopped what he was doing and heeded the call and went towards Jesus. How many folks could truly say that they're capable of doing that? We know the Apostle Matthew did, as did two of the other apostles who just happened to be fishing. The third trait the child demonstrated was submission. The child didn't know what the Lord Jesus Christ was going to ask him to do, and, and as, as ones who, are, who aren't children, we adults and, and um, young folks, we, we have doubts sometimes when someone asks us to do something. We have fears. We, we don't know if we're capable of doing what, what God asks us to do. We have this, this fear in our minds that he's going to ask us to do something that we may be incapable of doing, and it's scary to think about. And, but Jesus called the child to stand amongst a, a group of men who were probably towering over the child. And that would be intimidating for, for most of us, uh, especially, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're as short as me and you stand like well, amongst people who are six foot tall. That can be quite intimidating. And then to, to be, not be aware of, of someone, what someone's going to ask you to do, it's, it, really is, it really is intimidating. But the child submitted anyway. Um, John had said in his uh, lesson two weeks ago, put your hands in their hands. Trust, submit, and trust. The fourth trait that the child demonstrated is humility. And that's the most important thing that the disciples needed to learn. Um, 
Uh, again, it's written in Matthew, Matthew 18, 4. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So all of the, the three preceding traits, trust, obedience, submission, culminate and coalesce into this fourth trait, uh, uh, which is humility. Um, and it's interesting that until children, little children start interacting with the adult world, they don't really know anything about being famous they, or being popular or being wealthy or, or having a job that sounds cool. They, they don't know what competition is. They, they don't know what consumerism is. And they don't know that those things drive a lot of what the world does. They, they don't normally take initiative either. They're just content being who they are and doing what they're doing. And children of that age typically they're not self-conscious about things, nor are they embarrassed by the things that the adults care about. I'm, I'm, I'm sure those of you who had little kids, you probably dressed them up in who knows what, what kind of pajamas and had them run around the house, and they didn't care. Now, take yourself and put yourself in those pajamas. Would you be running around in front of your, your family or friends in that? Uh, none, of us, <laughs> none, none of us probably would. Um, and if, if you have, and you do, that you can I just keep that to yourself. Um, but children, they, they don't know anything about fame. They don't know anything about popularity. They don't know anything about wealth. They don't know anything about position. And y you have to wonder if that's what Adam and Eve were like before the fall, before sin entered the world. They, they obeyed God. They trusted God. They submitted to God until that one encounter with the serpent and the horrible choice that, that they made. But children deep down know that even though they, they may not realize it or be aware of it, that the ones you call mommy and daddy will provide for you and lead you and take care of you no matter what. Children don't know the how, the when, or the why, but they know the who. Children who haven't been stained by the outside world must have been what Adam and Eve were like before the fall. It's important, too, to notice that Jesus didn't humiliate his 12 disciples. He didn't call the child over to degrade them or cause them harm or cause them pain or, or take away whatever dignity they had. There's absolutely nothing worse, and we've all experienced this in the modern world that prizes competition, than to have someone destroy your dreams and aspirations, to highlight your failures and gloat while you're down. And, and it's worse when it's someone who calls himself a Christian who, who does that to us or someone we know. Uh, what kind of witness is that? Um, humiliation destroys hope in people. So the Lord Jesus Christ didn't humiliate his disciples, but he did teach them humility through this child. And, and the only ones that, that Jesus humiliated were, were the Pharisees who, who thought they knew everything and they were misleading everyone in the community. Uh, so let's talk about humility for a moment. So according to Nitin Nohira, so he's a Harvard Business School dean, um, and he says there's three types of humility. And we'll use his definitions, but we'll look at them through the lens of scripture. So the first type of humility is intellectual humility. He describes this type of humility as the knowledge that no matter how smart we think we are, or how many years of school we have, or what our diploma or diplomas say, there's still a lot of learning to do, especially a lot of learning from others. So when, when John and Michael and I, as we've taught, our lessons have, have tended to cross over. And sometimes teaching the same set of verses over the past few years is always new insights to, to, that we learn from each other. Uh, we, we don't know everything, and, and neither, no, the three of us, we're not entitled to be the smartest person in the room unlike the Pharisees who thought they had a monopoly on scriptural knowledge until someone named Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth um, completely shattered their reality and was pointing out that they didn't know it all. And we, we don't know it all either. The second type of humility is called moral humility. So Nohira describes this as the awareness that no matter how self-assured you are about your moral compass, you are vulnerable under stress or in certain situations to losing your way. None of us is like Superman, who is uh, invincible against uh, the bullets of sin. That they're not going to bounce off us. None of us is like Black Widow, who can take down all, every thug that, that comes out to attack her. We're, we're all vulnerable, all of us. And the, the devil knows our vulnerabilities. 
And actually, the marketing companies and the internet algorithms know our vulnerabilities as well. We're, we're all vulnerable, especially in stressful situations. And, and those vulnerabilities can cause us to lose our way and take us off course. Uh, this is most likely what the 12 disciples were suffering from at that moment. They let the fact that they were Jesus' chosen ones get to their heads and suddenly they become vulnerable. And suddenly there's strife within their group. So the third type of humility is personal humility. And no, no hero describes this as listening intently to others, celebrating small milestones, recognizing the contributions of team members, and, and also accepting the praise of others. Although at its core, it's basically recognizing and celebrating others. And this, this isn't giving a compliment to someone and then expect the, with the expectation that they'll heap praises upon you in return. This is a humility that asks for nothing back. In our study passage, Jesus' chosen 12 disciples were, were clearly not celebrating each other because they were arguing over who was the greatest. They were attempting to celebrate themselves. Intellectual humility, moral humility, personal humility. So, so knowing what we know now, uh, it, it's easy to see who in these three short verses um, were being childlike and who was acting childish. So let's look at three lessons to learn from a child, and we'll look at these in the, forms of in the form of questions. So the first question is, where are your thoughts focused on on a daily basis? Are you focused on your accomplishments, your reputation, your need for things because other people have them? Are you focused on being better than, than someone else and letting people know it? That's the direction the, the world wants us to go. The, the world wants us to focus solely on ourselves and, our, and on our own needs. And, and there's nothing wrong with focusing on our jobs and doing it right and doing, comp, doing it competently or earning money to feed yourself and your family or focusing on a hobby. Where things go wrong is when we focus on ourselves where we want to be the center of attention because when that happens, God is no longer the center of attention in your life. No longer, at that point, no longer does your job honor God, but it, it just honors you. No longer does your money honor God, it honors and serves only you. No longer do our relationships honor God, they, they honor only us or our selfish desires. And no longer does our hobby honor God, it, it only honors us and, and creates this need for us to hoard accolades for ourselves and only ourselves. And there have been people who've claimed that they're serving their community, their country, their family, but when you look at what they're doing, especially what they're posting or how they're talking about it with others, they're, they're really only seeking attention for themselves, accolades for themselves, praise for themselves. So be wary of such people and don't fall into the trap of being that. Because as human beings, we, we really are good at convincing ourselves that we're right when most of the time we're not. And if you get honest with yourself in, in whatever you do, the moment you walk outside of the doors after worship is over, what's the first thought that's going to go through your head? And does it have anything to do with truly and genuinely honoring God? If an action or thought or occupation or possession or relationship doesn't honor God in the life of someone who says they follow Jesus, then the true follower of Jesus will give that thing up. So, do you need to give something up today, something that's occupying your thoughts? The second question, are you living for the kingdom of God or are you in your own kingdom? Or are you living um, in your own kingdom? So if the Lord Jesus Christ had to warn his very own 12 disciples, his chosen 12, then how much more should this passage serve as a warning to us? There is no greatness here, here on earth because there's always going to be someone better than you. If you hold a world record, if you have one, it, uh, that's going to be broken by somebody. Someone at work will get the same accolade or award um, as you. Maybe they'll get more. Someone will have a better car than you. Um, Someone will have a better uh, and bigger paycheck. Someone may have a, a spouse who looks physically better than yours for now. Um, and we're, we're conditioned by the world to prize and obsessively pursue building a kingdom for ourselves and to ignore the kingdom of God. Uh, so how do we get back on track? The, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to turn, 
to repent, to change course. And, and it's not just here in Matthew, but all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation where it's talked about how people need to turn. Which leads us to our final question. Are you willing to step down in life? So we rise up in stature at work, or we get that dream job and we meet our goals, we get that dream house or that dream car, but everything has a price and the higher we are in life, in the world, the further away we are from God. So that means stepping down, and is that something that we can, we can do? If you're living in a house with your family and finances are stretched to the limit and you or your spouse are working long hours and the kids need to be taken care of and the bills are piling up, could you, let's say, give up the house and scale down to a smaller one or to an apartment so that one of you can focus solely on the kids? Or could you leave this area for a place in another part of the country that's not as expensive where the weather probably isn't going to be good? year-round, but where you can bring in a steady income and survive, whether you have a family or you're single. I know someone who actually did this. We, we worked together and he, he had what some would consider a, a, a prestigious job in the, in the Bay Area. He had a big home. Um, both he and his wife were working long hours and it was putting a strain on their relationship and uh, on a strain on their kids as well. And, one day out of the blue, he just decided to quit. He packed up his family and left the Bay Area and went back to their home state of Minnesota so that he could work, and not even in an office environment. He was working outdoors as an engineer, and she stayed at home to take care of the kids. Or there was a, a, a podcaster recently who said that his wife was a doctor and was only in practice for a very short time before she gave that up to stay at home with their children as they were growing up. And, and this... and. She had invested all this money on medical school and had gone through her residency and not long after she was actually in practice, she just, I know that, that my family's more important, my kids are more important. And so she gave it up. She gave it up. Or there's a good friend of mine who was offered a job as an investigator with NCIS. And his, uh, but, and he was offered the job, but it was in another state. And his girlfriend at the time, who's now his wife, needed to be closer to her family because a lot of them have medical issues. Uh, and a lot of them, uh, the, those medical issues were, were, were pretty serious, that they were coming to, to the end of their lives at that time. And my friend decided that I'm going to give up on this dream. I'm going to give up on my dream of being an investigator with NCIS and, and traveling the world. And so he turned it down because he knew that would take him away from his wife, and that would take her away from her family. And in the world's eyes, all three of these people step down in life, and the world says that they're failures, that they made a mistake. But looking through the lens of Scripture, that was no mistake at all. This is what God wants all of us to do if we're to be allowed to enter the kingdom of heaven. God will not accept anyone who's proud in his kingdom. If a person will not step down for their family, their future family, or even in their singleness, then that person will mo most definitely not step down for God. Because that pedestal or throne of glory was never, 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 ever meant for us. It only belongs to God himself. And that's why we have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to warn us, to constantly remind us that we need to do a reality check of our, ourselves daily, and if necessary, turn. So, so let this be a challenge to examine yourself daily, to repent, to change course, to step down, because the way up is down, the path to eternal life is through the narrow gate, which few in this life will find, and the way forward is through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ.